Okay, let me see if we are live. I believe we are. One second. And we're live. <laughs> Beautiful. Okay, so we'll just give people a few minutes to sink in, come on and share this out in a few groups. As you come on, please let us know uh, where you're tuning in from because it's a lot of fun to see, to see where everyone is listening from. And we'll do introductions here in just a second. Okay. All right. So I will introduce both of you now and then we'll dive in. Okay. So everybody today we are taking a deep dive into a really beautiful dialogue around the archetype of the martyr and the archetype of the muse and really looking at how these energies show up to animate the sacred sexual expression and how that really shows up to animate all of life. So we'll dive in, but first I wanna introduce everybody too, if you don't already know, these two brilliant beings of light, Julie, formerly known as Anaya Sophia, and the artist, formerly known as Pete. <laughs> I love it. So thank you both for being here. Uh, it's, it's great to really be able to deepen the dialogue with both of you because you are sacred sexual visionaries and pioneers, really pioneering dialogue that perhaps has never been spoken. Um, it's, it's a new way of being with the language of love on this planet. So just a deep bow to the work that you're both doing. Yeah. Much, Betsy. It's it's so it's so exciting to be here in this very live and you know not knowing what's going to happen next moment with you. Yeah, it's so true, isn't it? The live forum really does provide this spontaneous juiciness. So yes, okay. So Ankara, I see you. Thank you for being here. Go ahead, Pete. I was going to say I feel like a legend in my own lunchtime. You said you feel like a legend in your own lunchtime. I love it. Well, I mean, it is a legacy that you all are leaving. And one of the one of the beautiful pieces and, and really, uh, you know, I'll go ahead and tell you, everybody who's listening, I, I've been following uh, and really tuning in on a deep level with Julie and Pete's journey over the years. And it has touched me on such a profound level to witness the unfolding of not only the, the deep sacredness that they bring to their life and their relationship and the work that they do, but also their willingness to be visible, to show up even, even when, even when it's hard, you know, and you guys have been so brave and so courageous to put yourself out in such a way that people see you. And, you know, that, non-hidden brilliance is something that I think has been longing. People have been longing for that for so long. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll go ahead and dive in because people will just come on as they will. And we thank you in advance for your, your full body attunement and listening to this conversation. So, okay, we'll, we'll take a dive. So, over the years, really over the last decade of working with women, many women, but also men and couples in, in the birthing realms and also in the sacred sexual realms, one of the biggest pieces that shows up is a sense of underlying shame or guilt. And shame is a tricky thing, isn't it? <laughs> it it's, it's almost, it's a very, it's a very hard thing to feel. Right. So and even maybe even underneath that is this this concept of original sin. 
And so I'd love for you all to speak into that. You know, what is your your understanding of original sin and how is that affecting humanity? Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't know whether you know, but most of my inspiration and devotion comes from the Gnostic texts. Mm -hmm. And in the Gnostic texts, there is a theory that back in the day of the Garden of Eden, if there was such a place, it's all sim symbolic. Yes. Back in the day of the Garden of Eden, us humans used to make love in the presence of our presiding angel. Mm. So every couple had an angelic force that overlooked the love-making process mm. and guided us and inspired us and moved us here and moved us there. And it was a very, very holy affair. Mm. Now, us humans apparently started to whisper to one another, hey, let's do it without the angel. Let's go behind the tree and do it our way. Mm. And apparently that's what we did. We learned how to make love, but then decided we didn't want to do it in the, uh, the gaze of that angelic counterpart. Mm. So we started to do it our way. And the actual frequency or the resonance of the lovemaking act began to disintegrate. And the Gnostic texts tell us quite clearly, when we were in alignment with the angelic guidance, our Ida and Pingada, our Caduceus, you know, our serpentine yes. Kundalini, went absolutely up through the spine in a very vertical alignment and connected us with our original origins. Mm. Apparently, when we started to do it our way, without the angelic guidance, that Ida and Pingala started to point downward and look to the unseen eye like a tail and actually embed itself into not so much the natural world, but mm. the very, very, very beginnings of the material world. When I say world, I mean industry, buildings, the matrix. Right. Obviously, back at that time, it, it was so subtle because nothing like that had been formed. But the agenda, if you like. Mm -hmm. um, so that is my concept of original sin. It has definitely, in my heart, absolutely got something to do with sex. Mm -hmm. We lost something through the art of sex. And I believe we may come back into contact with it again through that very same method. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, uh, my take, <laughs> beautiful. Um, as, as often, Julie takes the, the more top-down role, the spiritual, and I, I naturally take the bottom up role which is more like a, a grounded more human kind of aspect. neither is right or wrong they're just different aspects so beautiful so my, my take on the original sin it's a bag of horse shit put on us by the church of rome to mm -hmm. keep the ordinary everyday people under the rule of the priests so that the priests could then take money for for praying for ordinary people mm -hmm. and keep the coffers filled so Guilt and shame built into us before birth if our parents are from a, a Catholic tradition mm -hmm. or even a, a Christian tradition in some of the other hardline forms. Mm -hmm. And it's complete and utter crock. Mm -hmm. Because it's like um, the, the idea that anything from creation is created intrinsically bad is just simply illogical. Yes. But, you know, Successive popes have made sure by killing off thousands of people who thought any other way that um, this is the way it's going to be, and it's been enforced. It's been taught that way. Yes. On the flip side, I heard a really interesting and important trend, um, 
recording yesterday about another definition of original sin. And it is where we became separate from God. That, that it's the forgetting that we are part of the same superintelligence, the, the source behind all things. And our separation is the original sin. And that's a whole different spin, which makes to me, to my heart, much, much more sense. Mm -hmm. And our reconnection to source that's that's the job we've got going. That's the work in progress. Whip. Right. That's the healing balm, the 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 great return. And the, 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 the interesting thing is the the church version of original sin makes us codependent upon the priesthood. This reconnection with whatever we know God goddess to be, that's a personal journey. That's a whole different focus. No need for books or priests or uniforms or specific ways of praying or specific ways of kneeling, whatever. It's we can go again. Just like the cathars from this weekend. Yeah. And it's so interesting because you know, shame that arises from what you just spoke of, especially when you're talking about the, the birth imprints, the gestational imprints, you know, really the conception at conception, these imprints that began to really embed themselves within the nervous system, embed themselves within the, you know, the cellular memories of our, of our being. Um, perhaps that's what makes shame challenging to get at because it's, it's so deeply embedded that it's, it's like, it's subtle, but it's massive because it's not necessarily something that we've had a direct experience with. Now, most of us have at some point been shamed or humiliated or guilted into whatever, but it's deeper than that. It's so, it's like, it's like almost like it's in the blood or something. I always see that guilt is a wound. It's actually a place. You can feel it in the body. Whereas shame is kind of like from head to foot. It's, mm. it's a field. So you can't actually find it. Because as soon as you go, it's over here, it jumps over there. Uh -huh. So it's like a complete entire field of feeling. Mm. Yeah. And it's interesting because if it's a field of, of feeling... People, it's, people are much more prone to stretch into the field of shame than they are to actually stretch into their full-on expression and multidimensionality and really divinity. Well, I mean, if you, if you say, think about it, um, anyone, that, anyone that's grown up to parents within any kind of hardline tradition, religious tradition, from the point of conception, each child is living and growing into a field that's pre-verbal of shame. There is no way mm. that child can actually think outside of that shame. It's in the blood. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and Julie's got a great, you know, version of that between her her, her own parents, for example. Mm, please do tell, share your story. It's that, um, Julie's father's Catholic, Irish, her mother is agnostic, or I would say she's more like pagan these days. Mm -hmm. But uh, all beautiful credit to mother, she didn't want Julie brought up in the Catholic Church. So she refused to get her baptized. So mm -hmm. her father's guilt trip for himself and for the honest belief that Julie is risking going to hell because she's not baptized. Mm -hmm. And that, that right from the beginning, before being baptized before that age, yeah. already there, yeah. field of shame. Uh -huh. And Julie, would you say that you took that, took on that, that shame? I and mean, how did that animate your life? Well, I'm not, I'm not sure I felt it as shame. What I felt was now a curiosity. Mm -hmm. You know, what is this devil character? What is this? You know, what are these forbidden things? And so. I, be, I had a curiosity, mm -hmm. is the best way to describe it. I had a huge curiosity for the light, 
But I also, if the truth be told, also absolutely needed to know firsthand what is this other energy that is not God. Yeah. So, you know, in my 20s, 30s, I was really exploring that. And I got the answer. <laughs> <laughs> it is very real force. Yes. Yeah, it, this kind of stuff does exist. So that's it. I've, I have my evidence and I have now retracted mm -hmm. from that uh, curiosity and uh, I am now satiated. <laughs> it's like, yes. Uh -huh. well, one thing I would like to raise, although I have my opinion, Pete has his about your question. We are, however, reading a book at the moment called Cupid's Poisoned Arrow. Mm -hmm. uh, this is talking about how when a male ejaculates and a female orgasms, mm -hmm. we release these procreation chemis chemicals and hormones into the brain, mm -hmm. telling our system we are procreating, we are multiplying, you know, we are feeding the human race. But if that is not what is actually happening, what that will do within days is start to turn into an agitation or an irritation. Mm. And so the book is saying that if we can elegantly refrain, so not, not force, <laughs> elegantly refrain from the ejaculation or the orgasm, we won't be going up and down in relationship. That we will finally lose this hormone-driven procreation program and slide into this um, longing more for intimacy. Mm. And so as I read this book, not that I'm reading it much, it's mostly Pete, but when I do pick it up and, and dip in, then that takes me back to that Garden of Eden Gnostic tale. Maybe what the angel was saying was, hey, guys, you know, hold back, hold back, mm -hmm. you know, move your energy here, expand at this moment, expand, open, expand, open. And what we did, us humans, without the angelic guidance, was just learn how to orgasm, how to ejaculate, not because we wanted kids, but we wanted that pleasure sensation. And maybe it just turned more and more deviant. And instead of a verticality, we started to go down into the matrix and become more horizontal rather than vertical. That's my two penny. Wow. So beautiful. It almost It's almost when you speak, you, you almost sing. It's really quite radically delicious. So... Yeah. Yeah, the muse coming through you so strong when you when you just spoke. Yeah. So, okay, so let's dive into this aspect of the martyr. So yeah. the martyr archetype and the frequency that, that ultimately is the martyr. So by definition, what we're speaking into is a, a shadow expression of the martyr. So the martyr that sacrifices something of great value and especially life itself mm. for the sake of a principle a belief a limiting thought a program an agenda whatever that is you know and this ultimately leads to self-sabotage self-sacrifice that does not serve the individual or humanity so what in your understanding is the martyr and what are, what are people getting out of expressing this way out of living this way or allowing that energy to animate through them what are the payoffs there well <laughs> we can name some i mean i i hear pity pity comes to me that's one the way I understand martyr is it's quite widespread in yes. my experience. 
I, I don't feel I, I'm still a martyr. But it did show up as this. Shaping myself and my attitudes and my past times and the way I dress and the way I do my hair, basically everything shaping myself to suit and gain appraisal from the partner. Mm -hmm. And that is a little bit like that uh, frog in the boiling pan of water on the stove story. Mm -hmm. so the frog jumps into the pan of water and goes, yes, water, excellent. So he's happy now. But the other switches the gas on. And the frog's like, whoa, this is wonderful. Now the water's getting nice and warm. Oh, my God. And the frog is jumping and frolicking and excited that the water's getting warm, which is, I guess, what I would have been doing, shape-shifting, changing myself, gently, slowly, looking at what pleases him, looking at what doesn't please him. And then finally, the flame is so high now that the water is actually boiling and the frog is being boiled alive. And so that boiling alive is when you realize, holy shit, I have forgotten all the things I love. I've dropped my friends. I don't do anything that pleases me anymore. I don't even recognize who I've become anymore. Mm. And then the frog is lying belly up in the pool of water. So that, even though I'm not a people pleaser and I haven't done heroic acts of martyrdom, but I have done that many, many times. So it's like a slow burn, a slow martyrdom. But so, I'm not really sure what, what you get out of it. Huh. Apart from someone to blame. Uh -huh. Because that's what eventually comes at the end. Wow. I, blame I blame him for making me do all of that stuff. So not having to take responsibility, not having yeah. to take ownership of the experiences or the pain or the whatever it is. Yes, yes. Mm. Yeah. All right, Pete, what's your take? Yeah. Yeah, I've been a lifelong martyr. Okay, let's I've, hear it. <laughs> I've more often called him the victim, another archetype. But the two archetypes are quite close, and it, yeah. it's quite difficult to, to separate them. But, for example, Julie mentioned the, the, the idea of pleaser. I've been a lifelong pleaser. I grew up alone with my mother, learning to stay two steps ahead of her to keep her sweet because she was doing so much for me as a single mother. Note, single mother. There's a very interesting straight in angle there of, of martyrdom. And you said to keep her sweet. You said to keep her sweet? Wow. As in more, because she was working so much, it was to, to make sure I wasn't a burden to her. So I, was, I became the ultimate good boy, did homework on time, took care of my clothes, was everywhere I should be on time. Never was a fuss or a problem for anyone. And so that carried on into adult relationships where I tried to deliver what the current partner wanted as the perfect partner. And you can see the red line through this is the martyr's masking of apparent acts of service, but it's from a give to get energy. And that's the thing that, that, that um, destroys the actual um, sequence of events. The, the give to get, I'm doing this for you, an act of service, and I want you to give me love in return. I want you to keep me in return. And if I go on doing all these acts of service, which could cost me my own health, and certainly will cost me my own happiness, and maybe even my own life, that I trade those for your love. Mm -hmm. the, the, the egoic payoff, it, I mean, the, both the victim and the martyr, their egoic payoff is, is pretty much the same. It's a control function. I'm trying to control you 
by making you feel guilt or shame. And when you feel bad, then I've got you because then I can get out of you what I want. So I, it's taken me quite some time, and it's been thanks to the loving presence of Julie that I've been able to go through this and be able to feel it in real time, maybe with a few sharp pointers from her. You know, but I recognize it as, as been such an intrinsic part of my makeup that I didn't know who I was. I still can't say this is who I am. It's more I can say this is who I I'm not this any longer. Mm-hmm. But it started from such an early age with my mother. And I, I suspect there's a lot of guys caught in this. And it's in some form of the mother wound. Something that we start with our single mothers and it carries on into our um adult relationships of keep it short it's it's it is a get out it means somebody else still needs to take care of us and in in adult relationships that's the grown-up man who is another child to his partner yeah you can see the and of course what she should have beside her is a guy not that he knows it all, but is is willing to face his inadequacies and walk with her rather than meeting her as a crutch. Uh-huh. So, so this, is that, this is that individuated intimacy and, um, you know, even something, I mean, I know language and terminology is somewhat limiting, but even living into this concept recently of, of power partnerships, you know, where we're, where we're coming in and we are, empowering each other we are showing up again and again and again to feed each other the food and water of life mm. and you know from that the power partnerships to me are not defined by codependency not defined by manipulation you know th- those kinds of energies simply don't survive because the the you know the partnership is um, so sacredly contained within itself. And we were speaking about this before we went live. And I think this is something that we can, you know, begin to weave the thread into, which is, so another aspect of martyrdom, as we're speaking about it, is having back doors wide open, backdoorism. So I'm in a relationship, I'm just speaking this in this way. I'm in a relationship, but I have a back door of if this gets too sticky or too hard or feels triggers me in a way that feels similar to how I've experienced other relationships or however that may be. I've got that back door that I know I can. It might even look like I'm just going to tune out, you know, or I'm just going to physically walk out or whatever that back door may be. But it sucks the life literally the aliveness and the innocent curiosity and the alchemical brilliance that is a sacred relationship. Yeah. Yeah. So what, what say ye about this idea of not even idea, but this embodied possibility of sacred union and power partnerships and, and, and backdoorism. I like backdoorism. Um, backdoorism can be something as dense as I am secretly meeting someone behind your back mm-hmm. or I am still in contact with my ex who will give me attention when you don't or I'm setting a little something up as a safety net should this not work out. So that's like dense backdoorism. Mm-hmm. <laughs> can be really subtle, which is, is what you said, just tuning out and just going off into the world of thoughts or your own, uh, you know, to-do list. Yeah. Even that tourism. Oh, yes. But, you know, like not being present, diverting the eyes when you're having a conversation. That's back tourism. Totally. <laughs> 100% agree. Yes. Uh, oh, this is fun. What else is backdoorism? Backdoorism <laughs> is a naughty backdoorism that I once had when I was a much younger lady. Uh-huh. Is I would watch a movie uh-huh. and 
movie might have a really hot guy playing it, and then oh, really naughty, naughty backdoorism, mm -hmm. then we'd make love that night, mm -hmm. and I would start imagining. Woo! Yeah. Guy from the movie. Not too much, but enough to bring in a little a panaz, a little je ne sais quoi. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, there's a whole world of thought that says all of this is totally okay. Relax, chillax. You know, this is this is the new paradigm. But what I'm really talking about is energy, energy, accountability, integrity. We can say it's all okay and everyone's in agreement, but do we want to be accountable? Do we want to be vertical? Going back to that Garden of Eden story again. Because I want to be vertical. I don't want to be horizontal anymore, playing my games, you know, a little sideline here, a little sideline there. This might be the one and only life. There might be no such thing as past lives. There might not be no such thing as future lives. This could be the be all and end all. So I'm wanting vertical. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So all be in, being all in. All in. Let's do this. We've been reading about sacred union for so long. Oh, yes. Okay, let's go there. Let's really go there. Right. Embody, be it right here and right now. Yeah. Wow. I want to I want to shine light on the biggest of men's please um, do back doors is the subject of porn I I've, I've been go. I've been a lifelong porn addict mm -hmm. until we got together um mm -hmm. it is the number one back door because it's not easy relationship let's face it the deeper it goes is not easy if it were easy, everybody would be doing it. It takes the capacity to stand there in the storm, fully present and taking part in the conversation. And it's difficult for either the man or the woman, if it's in intense, to find the right reasons to make love in the first place after you've just had an argument. For some people it works, but as a pattern, it doesn't work. Yes. Yeah, so many guys, you know, sex just falls by the wayside for, for a variety of reasons. But instead of taking up the conversation of why aren't we making love anymore, which is we actually did a video called Sex, the Conversation We're Not Having. Mm. You know, what happens six months, a year, two years into every relationship that the passion dies and the sex stops unless it becomes routine on a Thursday when you book a, you know, book of babysit and the dogs are asleep you know <laughs> and, and coming back to the that julie mentioned um cupid's poison arrow yeah it's it supposes there's a 14 day chemical set of effects that happen on to anybody anybody man or woman that's either ejaculated or orgasmed mm -hmm. and it one of the uh, some of the effects are that it actually drives the two people away. It's, she, she's saying it's part of a survival mechanism. Mm -hmm. We're designed to be able to make love, well, to have sex, to copulate with anybody at random. But once a man's made love or once a man's ejaculated, he's already turning over, looking, the, looking for something else. Mm. This this drives them apart because the real love making, the sacred union, more really interesting, is more close to a, a parent child love. It's that kind of it's healing. It's not about producing more children or the drive to. It's about creating a field together and going deeply into that. So every time a guy turns to porn. He's making this process carry on. And it's, you know, it's, there's so many cues in the discussion around sex. Because for many men, myself included, 
the frequency, how often lovemaking happens, has a direct effect upon my self-worth. Mm-hmm. I feel less of a man. This is how I was would be speaking up until recently. I feel less of a man the longer it goes between lovemaking um, events. So you can see how endemic this, this situation is. It's a self-killing situation. Men are actually causing themselves and their partners such problems and then guilt and shame on top. It's driving them apart. Mm. So big, you know, kick the porn addict addiction like any other addiction. You can do it, men, but you have to really want it. For, and I, same for me. I had to want it for my love, my love, my loving relationship with with Julie. It mm. had to be that bigger than the addiction. And you know, use that energy inside the relationship instead of backdooring on screen. Mm-hmm. Not going to Facebook as a backdoor, but mm-hmm. right. You know, it's interesting you brought up this this piece about reparenting, repatterning each other through through the the sexual expression with one another. And I think that's it's such a beautiful way to understand really a foundational aspect of sacred sexual relating is that it's not a, you know, a taking. It's not a, um, uh, I don't know, um, lack of words here, but I'm just hearing that that's a really beautiful piece that you brought up that even can help with kicking the addictions. It's beginning to live into the sexual experiences from that place of, okay, we're going to repattern something by bringing our bodies together in, you know, full body prayer right now. This will be that prayer. And it's almost like every time we bring our bodies together, we have the opportunity to rewire some aspect yeah. of ourselves. Yes. Yes. And it's yeah. really bringing a consciousness to that because you were talking about, you know, when we ejaculate, you know, the body responds as if we're creating new life. Mm. Mm. And then there's that irritation that comes around when that doesn't happen. So I'm curious to even lean into this a little bit. And this is where the muse really begins to come into play because the muse steps in and, and like the act of lovemaking is, is um, it's really our bodies are our instruments and we're, you know, we're in a symphony together and we're expressing, you know, poetry through however we um, exist together and what expresses from that. So I guess what I'm trying to say is, is when we reach orgasm, how do you feel about immaculately conceiving, consciously conceiving ideas, creative visions, um, you know, and using that energy to to create, but in a very different way, or perhaps hmm. not too different? Hmm. Well, this is definitely the kind of stuff I've been writing the kind of stuff I've been dreaming. Um, but now I'm in a different place. I'm in a place of living this. And to make this jump from the realm of the muse, who so understands everything, and then she comes down and finds herself in a flesh body. <laughs> in a meat suit. <laughs> and is trying so so beautifully to bring that grace down and through. Yes. So that's where I am at the moment. Knowing everything that you've just said is absolutely, absolutely divinely true. But I'm not living it yet. Mm -hmm. And I truly pray and humbly ask that I, both of us are able to. But what, yes, what you've said, that is it. That is the template. That is the blueprint. Mm. The only thing I might personally be doing at this stage of my life is as the orgasm comes, because it's not just through this book, Cupid's Poisoned Arrow, we've also been listening to Barry Long and also, you know, the, the Gnostic texts. So I've got three very powerful mystery schools coming into my life, revealing this message. So I'm paying attention. 
Mm-hmm. So what I might do personally in the Love Making Act is, um, you know, gather the energy for a, a for an orgasm, mm-hmm. but not so motivated as usual. Definitely no sense of goal orientation. But I don't know about you, but when the orgasm feels like it's really coming, I would probably squeeze a little bit on the inside. Mm-hmm. And that is what sets it right off. <laughs> <laughs> what I might do now is instead of squeeze, uh-huh. open. <sighs> and not chase those pleasure ripples. Mm-hmm. Expand instead. Mm-hmm. But that's going to take practice. Yippee. <laughs> yes. Because I'm programmed to do that little squeeze. Yes. So, and in that great big vast openness, yes, dream in, dream in what we're wanting to create together. Or maybe pray, pray in that moment. Yes. Maybe even like worldwide pray, prayers. Yes. It's and- just huge, humble, revelatory, creative processes. It's so profound. And, you know, so, so in my experience with what you're talking about, yes, the squeeze, I totally get that. And something that I have experienced is when you're talking about releasing outward, it to me almost feels like slightly downward, like almost like a, like an earth orgasm. Yes. So instead of like experiencing it above and more cosmic, it Mm. feels much more earth-based and expansive Mm. and afterwards the energy that's present around us Mm. you could almost stick your finger in it it's like this it's almost like um it's a womb space it's it's a a womb space that births and all of a sudden you just you feel that through that that act of love conscious love sharing and making you have birthed perhaps a a a whole new field of red i don't know what it is i'm still trying to figure out what it is and like you said we're you know we're pioneering these conversations but it's palpable in that moment of aftermath when you're in the cocoon when you're in the womb space you could draw that energy in via your breath and send it to any part of the body that's Mm. weakened Mm. or ailing in any way, any part of the mind that's split and confused, Mm. any part of the emotional system that's struggling. So, you know, that that's inner alchemy. Be aware of what you're in and, and navigate it, guide it, guide it here, guide it there. Yes. This is a resurrectory force. Mm. Resurrectory force. It's like from tomb to womb. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So beautiful. Mm. Doesn't it? It's just so, it's like, wah, 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 wah. <laughs> it's just this beautiful sound to have these conversations in this way. And, ugh. I'm loving this. Okay. I want to, I just want to look at my notes to make sure that I'm not missing any key points that I wanted to bring in. So would you say that this, this full body prayer, you know, this coming together in this way. So releasing the martyr, releasing the the shame and the, 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 the guilt through these, you know, full body prayers and this coming together. Um, so this field that we just spoke of, would you say this, really increases our magnetic resonance or I don't know if increases is the word, but strengthens our magnetic resonance, resonance and visibility. Absolutely. But can we put in that word intimacy as well? Yes. Um, I believe true intimacy, cuddles, face stroking, hair stroking, chest rubbing, this is the stuff that actually makes man and woman beautiful. Mm. Deep, deep beauty upon the face, upon you know the sheen of the skin. 
intimacy is also incredibly anti-aging. Yes. So soothing and comforting. It's gorgeous. And if you mix that with the passion, yeah. with, with the kiss of longing, with the strong bodies moving together in unity and the, and the dance of lovemaking, you put all of that into the mix, we're going to be here forever. <laughs> yes, it does. It produces timelessness. Yeah, yeah. And such relaxation in the mind. And, I mean, what would the world look like if every single woman on the planet had a relaxed womb? Mm. Ay, ay, ay. Can you imagine? Well, part of that is the partner playing his part yes and i want to draw you both away from the focus on orgasm mm -hmm. i know it, i know it's part of many schools teachings that it's that guys are not to ejaculate anymore but women it's healthy for them to orgasm mm -hmm. i'm not saying wrong all i'm all i want to speak about now is that's like bringing the whole of life's focus onto one event Yes. And what I want to say is, thanks to this, this book and actually me choosing to consciously be part of this non-ejaculatory thing, whether we're making love or not, mm -hmm. I'm fully on behind this. What I noticed, especially we've just come back from England, what I noticed over time, as it went over 14 days, I noticed myself that I had the capacity to be more loving. I was actively reaching out to Julie in, without any reason and, you know, connecting, touching, loving, kissing. Mm -hmm. You know, every time we got over a gate on a walk, they're called kissing gates in England. Mm -hmm. So that's what I did. I made sure we didn't go further until I had a kiss or gave a kiss. Uh -huh. what, I'm, what I'm getting at, by a guy getting behind this decision. I am not going to orgasm. To the best of my ability, one way or the other, I'm going to reinvest that energy into the field of us. And it really, absolutely, I believe I start to look different. I feel different. I feel good because I'm behind this. There is no guilt. There is no shame. And, you know, it feels more like we're a team in mm. this. So a woman's womb health is also down to the, the vibration from where the partner's coming from. Oh, so, so, so important. And rather than, rather than making all woo-woo and spiritual, not that that's wrong, mm. but if you're talking to a guy about it, get, get him into his body, feel in his body where he feels the words like joy that can you reach to a memory where it felt joyous between us it could have been an event in the past can you feel that yes where can you feel that put your hand on it now mm -hmm. anytime did you see what happened there you recall joy it wasn't in the room yeah as an idea it was presented to you and you recalled it the feeling of it you can do that any second of any day can you feel joy right now? Yeah, I can re recreate that and feel the same thing. Bringing that to the field. And the love making, it's not just one act upstairs between the sheets. It's from the moment you get up to the moment you fall asleep. So beautifully said. The whole thing is foreplay. Yeah, it's, or, it's orgasmic life. It's like... Mm -hmm. It's, you know, for me, it's really an extension of that. And I love that you brought this up because there is so much shame around not being able to orgasm or I wasn't able to get you off or you, right? So that, that piece is, is, I mean, I think it ails a lot of humanity. And, and a big piece of that is the porn piece that you brought up because we've been so programmed to think that it looks one way and that it ends one way. And if it doesn't end that way, that in some way we have failed. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. 
And so I mean, you're right. I mean, this conversation in itself is redefining, even redefining what orgasm is. Maybe that's even what it is. Is it's like it has been confined to something so, you know, I don't, I don't even know, like so denatured of what it actually is. Mm. So it's over, it, over you, focus on the event rather than the field that you're creating together. Exactly. Or the process, the journey. And that is yeah. an overarching metaphor for what so many of us have bought into, which is that we focus solely on the outcome and in, in all areas of life. And so where is the joy in the journey? Mm -hmm. Where is the joy in the process? The laughter. The laughter, the sacred humor. And that's one thing, Pete, that you so beautifully bring is that sense of sacred humor. And it's 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 the healing balm. It's it's so needed and necessary. There's, and there's it's an old Sufi other things. Quote. Yeah, there's an old Sufi quote, which is the shortest route between two people is laughter. It's it's so true. It's so true. And I experienced this deeply when I was pregnant with my first child. And uh, I would just, I'd literally have to pull off the side of the road because I would feel her move within me and I would have this orgasmic laughter. And I felt in that moment that we were one. Mm. Right. Mm. And, it was, and I mean, it was like, it was laughter. Like you just couldn't stop and nothing, nothing really made me laugh except just the joy of holding life within my belly. And feeling so deeply connected to that. So it's so true what you just said. Nothing like truth, beauty, and goodness just oozing out of this conversation. Mm. And that, to me, is the essence of the muse. Yeah. But, hey, you know, I've, I've just been to pick up two retreatants from, from one of the towns. And something that happens often, we live in an exceptionally beautiful part of France. It's almost ignored by the mainstream people. It's so green and verdant. There are so many hills and hidden valleys and all kinds of stuff. One of these women was crying just on seeing the greenness of the trees and the beauty mm. of the journey. So mm. getting out in nature mm. Thank is you. also an important part. That's the real therapist. Yeah, mm. make love to nature. Have the conversation Ooh. out there. <laughs> So, okay, just a, a quick list. What are some things? Okay, so a, awakening the muse, really beginning to romance your own heart. So sure. getting out in nature, foundational piece, like that is an absolute yes. So what are some other absolute yeses for um, moving out of me, martyrdom into musedom? Musedom for me is dressing up. Mm -hmm. Having a Lovely, wide, full-length mirror, playing some fabulous music. Uh -huh. And even before I start the dance, looking at myself in the full-length mi mirror, really making eye contact mm -hmm. and saying, sweetie, this is for you. Yes. <laughs> and then I just build up slowly into a huge crescendo and then bring it back to prayer so it begins and ends in prayer and it is, and it is a huge tribal fiery sufi passion piece mm. it begins and ends with the recognition all of that was for you mm. Mm. not me me the the human but also the existence and I have no clue what that existence is, but I feel it. Yes. So it's like a celebration, a celebratory life dance. Yes. Yeah, I was just thinking, what's the male alternate um, version of the muse? Well, it's interesting because the muse to me almost feels androgynous. Like I, I, I've even been just feeling into that. Like I don't necessarily think that it speaks as yeah. you know, an archetype solely through a woman. But if you say muse to a man, that won't that won't get him going. So <laughs> here, I love it. So let's create something new right now. One that works for us when we re when I remember to to say it and step into it. 
the the character Pan. Oh, love, love, love Pan. Healthy, dark, masculine smells, and you can combine that with the forest, mm. making love in the forest. Mm. That you know the, the scenario. She's got her back to him, and she can hear him coming through the undergrowth. And then he's really close and he's breathing uh -huh. on her neck from behind. And yeah. this, this energy that he is going to take her. Yes. Not from, a, not from a, a predatory way, as in, as in the kind of predators we're, we're suffering from at the moment. And not in a kind of, what do you call it, male? Like there's an expectancy amongst men in a lower vibration that sex is just something that of course they're going to get from their partner it's part of the job mm -hmm. it's not from that place at all mm -hmm. it's from the it's from the heart of the forest through his own heart to her oh and she must must drop the resistance because he's going to take her <laughs> anyway oh <laughs> so What's important, the vision there, you can give that to a man, Pan. Read up on Pan. What does he look like? How yeah. does he? It's confidence. There. Yes. And that's well, and this, this really brings part of it full circle because to me, Pan and the, and the muse essence, this is mm. original innocence. Mm. Yeah. This is that original curiosity that... Um, you know, the, the magical inner child awakened within the adult becomes the mystical adult. Mm, mm, mm. Right. So I love that. And I have a, a picture that I'll post in the comments of the live of Pawn and the Muse Essence together. Yeah. So beautiful yeah. and juicy. Yeah. I don't know. Um, sorry to hog the, hog the lens, but have you heard of a book called Iron John? No. As in the metal iron. Okay. I keep it but the, the whole book is the book that's behind the Mankind Project. Okay, I'm familiar with Mankind Project. Yeah. So what it's the book is talking about is the missing masculine. Mm. And the Iron John is a hairy, rusty-colored being that lives in the bottom of a pond in the darkest part of the forest. Mm. That, the entirety there is our missing masculine. Mm. Nobody knows what he looks like. He's just threatening because that's what we've been told he is. And yet no man has any kind of connection. No woman has experienced that. Pan is actually quite close in energy. So that gives the man permission to role play just as a muse is a role play. It's not true. It's a, it's a role. Fake it till you make it. Pan is his way in. In he is a creature of the forest. There you go, earth. Yes. Grounded masculinity. Yes. So interesting. And of course, stories, story medicine, such an important piece to rebirth now. Uh, people need story medicine so much. So, okay. I feel like we're, we're rounding this off. So... You know, to really bring it to a close, um, let's let's just speak into uh, original innocence and becoming a fully incarnated divine human by embodying by or by allowing this energy, what you just spoke of, pawn, by allowing the muse essence to really flow through us. Would you would you say that? Being a fully incarnated human really uh, brings us into a place of visibility where we can share our gifts in a way that, um, in a way that's so needed right now. Yeah, absolutely. Um, when you talk about original innocence, mm -hmm. that's gorgeous. Um, I don't have an, I don't have anything on that yet, but it is it is a quality. I really enjoy it's a it's a quality I love to see in others well no I mean it's a quality if I do see it in others I will cry because it's so exquisitely beautiful yes it's definitely um, a word I prefer to use rather than love 
because love is so overused. Mm. Use, love is used to um, describe all sorts of things that aren't really love. They have the, the give to get or the condition piece in there. But innocence, when you say the, the word innocence, you, you know what that is. Everyone knows what that is. Yes. And it immediately puts you in contact with it, like the word grace or mercy or goodness. You said goodness early earlier. So, yeah, innocence. Innocence. And it's interesting, too, you know, even with, you know, Julie, your birth name. Coming back into that place when when we were talking before, I, I just heard that it's like it is also this return to original innocence. So it's it'll be so beautiful to see how this really evolves for everybody. Yeah. But of course, like I said at the beginning, I have so just um, relished in mm. witnessing you mm. and. So yet another spiral. <laughs> yeah. We we've definitely um went since we've been together. Mm -hmm. I hope you don't mind me saying. <laughs> uh -oh. <laughs> but I would say that when Pete first appeared, he was quite serious. And also he's got 15 years worth of military background. Mm. So he has to be serious. Mm. He's been to be serious yes. and I, I think that's one of the, the things that came his way once we got together this invitation to play yes from that beautiful innocent realm mm -hmm. playing frolicking in the forest seeing the forest as a place of so many beings and creatures and guardians mm -hmm. yeah I, I enjoyed showing him that part of life mm -hmm. yes it's what it's it's also a, an aspect of timelessness and and really you know i watch my children and you know play is is the work of children and then somewhere along the way we get the message that in order to you know enter into adultism right that we have to in some way abandon that and and what we're speaking into today is no no we get to play. Yeah. We get just, to play. I want to add something from a from a guy's perspective. Yes. In time, the only person that can invite a man into his original innocence mm -hmm. is a loving partner. Mm. She is the one that opens the gate for him. Mm. Because guilt and shame have been used on him since early boyhood. His innocence was stripped from him so that he would become a team player, so he would support the system, so he'd go and fight stupid wars for some power politics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can hear the axe there get hit the ground. The thing is, he's never been told. And when he does, by someone that really knows him, really gets him and that he's beginning to trust, mm -hmm. I see and feel the innocent place you want to occupy. I can see what life has done to you, and I want to call you to come and play with me. Mm -hmm. It's an invitation, it's not a superior to an inferior, a mm -hmm. teacher to a pupil. Mm -hmm. I want you, I want to invite you to come and express everything in your heart mm -hmm. you have so buried for all these years. I want you to come and cover me with that, mm. like a blanket. Yeah, and I'm even seeing like an image of the Pied Piper, you know, this, again, back to this museum, this piece, it's really a remembering because something that I'm even feeling into is, do we lose our innocence? Is it something that can ever be lost? Or do we just put it away for safekeeping? And then that partner that you're speaking of, Pete, you know, Julie here before us, she's inviting you to remember. And you're inviting her to remember yeah. through the heart of the forest, through the essence of the multidimensional heart, you know, through this, um, you know, pioneering way of power partnership and sacred union. So. 
Yeah, it just feels important to honor that you all are such incredible role models, really. And I mean, I don't mean to put like tons of pressure on you guys or anything, but it is. It's like we all need reflections. Mm. Having those reflections is such an important aspect of awakening that part of us that had been put to sleep or that, you know, whatever, for whatever we did with it. Mm. So I just want to honor that here right now. And I'm just so thankful that we came together. I mean, this was spontaneous. Yeah, and, yeah, we heard, both heard the the inner yes, and yeah. and here we are. So you know, for those of you listening, you know, a reflection back to you to honor your inner yes, mm. and and to and to really um, live into it, not later, but now. Because think if we had just decided mm, mm, this conversation right here, right now, wouldn't exist, and it's so full of of golden nectar. So, okay. So if this resonated with you, please um, reach out, feel free to share it around. Obviously the more the merrier. And uh, Julie, tell us, Julie and Pete, tell us how people can find you. Well, we both have our Facebook accounts. And even if you do the name Anaya Sophia, you'll still find me. Great. Um, Pete Wilson, Anaya Sophia, Julie Cudahy. Um, my website, which is still AnayaSophia.com. Mm -hmm. YouTube channel, Anaya Sophia, mm -hmm. everywhere. So beautiful. And the video, Pete, you mentioned a video that you all did earlier. Do you remember which one? It was something um, about sex. Oh, the conversations that, uh, something about conversations and sex. The conversation we're not having. And it's an implication of that the the, the death of sexuality between a couple and no one's asking why. The okay. So is that, a, is that video available on your YouTube channel? Yeah. Great. Okay. So I'll find that and, and post that in the comments as well. So people can reference back to that. And then I'll also find a link to the iron John book because that feels like an important piece. That's the, the most important book for any guy to read. Okay. And then the other book that you mentioned was the Cupid. Cupid's poisoned arrow. Cupid's poisoned arrow. Okay. I'll make sure to reference those. So everyone here, thank you so much for tuning in. We honor that your time is sacred and this for sure is just um, a beautiful opportunity for everyone to really live into a very different way of being uh, not only with yourself, but in partnership with anything that you create and with all of life. So we thank you deeply. Um, Pete, thank you. you, beloved. Thank you so much. And we shall, I'm sure, talk again at some point. Okay. All right. That's bye for now, everybody. Bye.